Ah, greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, with another look at a regiment of the Imperial Guard, with today's feature being the Athonian Tunnel Rats. As their vernacular so cleverly makes clear, their specialization lies in subterranean warfare. Which might seem like a bit of a narrow field of specialization. I mean, really, how many wars take place underground? Well, the 41st millennium is a wide and varied place, and there are a surprising number of conflicts that takes place beneath people's feet. Especially when one takes into consideration that nobody made any mention of natural caves or tunnels here. As the Athonian Tunnel Rats' own name stems not from any proclivity towards natural caves on their home planet, but rather from the cavernous spaces beneath endless hydroponic fields. For you see, Athenos is an agricultural world. Yeah, of sorts, anyways, of a more mechanical variant than the usual image of a green verdant paradise. We have of course already talked about agricultural planets in another video on this channel, so if you want more generalized information about the wide variety of food growing worlds in the Imperium, then I do suggest you go hit that up. For now, let's focus on Athenos. So, Athenos' surface is largely covered by enormous stretches of hydroponic gardens. Layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of growth plants, where whatever crop is currently being cultivated will be provided with their particular requirements of light, oxygen, temperature, water, nutrients, etc. Now the precise details of what they grow on Athenus are unknown, as this is a lesser known regiment with lesser quantity of lore to it, but the fact that they use hydroponic farms means that, well, in reality, the sky is the limit. See. Well, literally, actually, as one of the main benefits of hydroponic farming is the fact that you can stack crops on top of one another. You can grow high. You can have as many stacks of crops as you have the ability to feed with water and nutrients. You also have very precise control over what you provide the plants with as well. This also in turn means that since you can control the environment and the water levels, the nutrients, yada yada yada, you can also grow essentially anything, so long as you have the ability to actually give it what it needs. If you're cultivating something that thrives best in a hot climate, well, you simply make a hot floor. A cold climate, perhaps, well, you do the opposite. And perhaps best of all, whereas traditional agricultural worlds often need to rely on the cyclical nature of crops, a hydroponic plant, properly set up and timed, can produce crops all year long. As one section of the plant ripens and is harvested, right next door, the next batch is growing happily to be harvested tomorrow, and the next batch thereafter, and the next batch thereafter. In effect, therefore, Athenos can produce bumper crop after bumper crop after bumper crop continuously for as long as it damn well desires. And considering again the space saving nature of hydroponics and the fact that these farms cover the majority of a planet, it would hardly surprise me if Athenos was one of the largest and most productive agricultural worlds in the Imperium. And with the natural advantages of hydroponics being able to grow damn near anything, it also wouldn't surprise me if it produces a great deal of cash crops as well. Luxuries desired by upper spire nobility. 
Now, of course, it's not all a dance on roses. Especially if you are aiming to produce a wide variety of crops, hydroponics requires a great deal of specialized knowledge, with each and every crop having subtly different requirements for the ideal composition of water, air, sunlight, nutrients, etc. etc. It also requires a tremendous amount of relatively complex equipment as well, particularly when you're growing on, you know, the size of a planet. Now, it does actually require surprisingly little water. That is one of the benefits of hydroponics, but it requires enormous quantities of specific resources to actually ply those plants with whatever they require. This too also might require the import of special nutrients. This in turn will also require then yet further expertise as to its handling, its storage under ideal conditions, and the way to actually deliver them to the plants. Athenos probably has multiple levels of local guilds, organizations, and perhaps even localized subservient variants of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Night worlds, for example, often have Sacristians, essentially tech adepts so far separated from the Mechanicus as to have become that world's local miniature equivalent, specialized in one field, usually knight's armors. In the case of Athenos, their pursuit would be a bit more placid, obviously, but all of this boils down to one thing. You have an enormously profitable machinery, with s loads of specialized pieces and parts. Everything needs to fit together, everything needs to run smoothly, and all of these dozens of tiny little cogs rely entirely on one another. Very harmonious, I'm sure, were it not for one other tiny little detail. The same little devil, in fact, that is responsible for the Athonian tunnel rats being so well versed in warfare. As I'm sure many of you are wondering, why is that even the case? This place sounds pretty neato chinto, frankly, populated near exclusively by people wearing little rubber gloves and wearing white outfits whilst working with plants all day. I really don't see where all of the violence comes into play, honestly. Well, it comes into play because, of course, Athenos is a very productive world and in turn then a very rich world. A very rich world that relies on many different stratas of society and specializations to remain wealthy. In other words, it is overflowing with special interest groups, each one utterly convinced that it is by far the most important in the entire food chain, and thus deserving of a far larger slice of the pie. And so, all of the various guilds, the mercantile organizations, the tradesmen's quorums, and the noble houses, far from the least of all, not to mention criminal gangs of every stripe and variety, all compete for a slice. And that is why the Athonian Tunnel Rats exist. As, of course, it would be tremendous bad form for the various legitimate organizations to be killing each other openly. Why, that's nothing short of savagery. No, get the gangs and the petty criminals to do it for you. That's how you do things in a civilized world, goddammit. And that is what they do. Now, I would imagine that in a world like this, they would primarily fight for... Oh, preferential access to storage yards filled with various crucial ingredients for their um, preferred form of crop. Alternatively, maybe they're fighting for access to funding to expand their own domains. Perhaps they're fighting over growing halls, or the license to use a new and extra lucrative little plant that has just been granted to their bountiful little world. Perhaps they simply argue over the favor of the larger houses for protection, or alternatively, the opposite of protection, active assassination. Why? Well, simply because somebody further up the food chain wanted it to happen. That's why.
And since virtually all of this takes place in the enormous subterranean complexes of the hydroponic gardens and in the, if possible, even larger sewers of the world, the fighters grow quite accustomed to claustrophobic conditions. And the sewers. Oh, God Emperor, the sewers. If anything, the Athonian Tunnel Rats should maybe be renamed the Athonian Sewer Rats. Because here's the thing, with an enormous hydroponics complex like this, obviously you are going to need a ridiculous amount of recycling. All of the water that is being used will preferably be reused by sheer simple necessity. Then the various ingredients will be re-added to it. But due to the fact that some crops might not like additives that others enjoy, you're going to need enormous cleansing plants that renders it down to just pure water again, stripping out any imperfections or impurities that might otherwise upset the delicate feces of the greenery. And considering the countless levels of hydroponics facilities and the amount of various ingredients and the presumably limited water supply, etc., well, it would make a bunch of sense to simply dump all of it into one singular titanic series of reservoirs and then clean it from there. I imagine the only thing that's of a comparable size on Anthenos to the hydroponics farms is the sewer and the tremendous water treatment plants that must be running non-stop beneath it. And seeing as the recycling plant is where all of the resources will end up one day anyway, I imagine the competition for who runs those plants and ensures that, you know, the reserves are routed in the correct directions. <laughs> that might be a heavily contested title. Regardless of which prize they are vying for, the aforementioned power structures are constantly carrying out low-level skirmishes, escalades, fights, sabotage missions, etc. in the bowels of Athenos. This in turn creates a rather active population, as everyone is involved in it in some way or another. Considering the fact that their very workplace, their living quarters, everything is tied directly to the hydroponic facilities and their various support structures, I guess the overwhelming majority of them will either be working directly for one of the organizations themselves or in their own little private armies. And so, when the Imperium comes knocking for their tithe, Anthenos has plenty of willing and able personnel to offer up, with of course their uh, specialization in mind too. Now, in many cases, Imperial Guard regiments are formed around fairly strict templates, usually decided either by what equipment can be provided for the world, as the majority of worlds are of course not really able to arm themselves effectively, or dependent upon the nearest forge world. For example, the reason why everyone seems to be wearing Cadian issue body armor is simply because they make a heck of a lot of it, and so that tends to be standard issue gear through sheer surplus. Whereas the Antonian Tunnel Rats are a bit special here, because they already have quite a bit of weaponry. Not necessarily locally produced, but um, sourced, shall we say. They also have, again, a specialization, meaning that they don't like certain things. A Athonian Armored Regiment, for example, would be a rare thing indeed, simply because they've shown no real aptitude for it, and they have no real ability to produce the armored reserves for themselves. Now, something like a light mechanized regiment, an armored fist formation, that might certainly happen, absolutely, as, well, whilst they're not very well suited at the mechanized part, they do excel in close quarters combat, which doesn't, of course, necessarily need to be underground. It could simply just be an urban combat environment and a ginormous armored box capable of taking you from point A to B without being murdered by machine gun fire is a sizable advantage in your average urban sprawl. 
but more often than not, the Hemthonian tunnel rats are raised as a light infantry, very light infantry, eschewing even light indirect support weaponry like mortars, for example, preferring to rely almost exclusively on short-range personnel weaponry, uh, melters, flamethrowers, a plasma gun here and there if they can be lucky enough to get one, and of course, massive amounts of las guns obviously, and a wide variety of close quarters implants. See, that's the thing with the tunnels. There tends to not be all that much in the way of warning before you're stood face to face with the adversary. And so something either small and maneuverable like a cut down las gun, for example, would be preferable, or a weapon that could simply turn the entire area behind the enemy into a lethal kill zone, like a flamethrower, for example. I would imagine the Anthonians would also put a uh, big premium on personnel weaponry. Um, stub guns, pistols, revolvers of all types, las pistols, plasma pistols, hand flamers if they're lucky enough to get them, though those are exceedingly rare, albeit you know, a regiment valued enough for their specialization might be able to swing something here and there. And considering the background of most of the Anthonian tunnel rats will be in, you know, organized criminal warfare, I imagine they, uh, they don't have too much in the way of scruples when it comes to acquiring favored pieces of hardware from the ever-present black market. Now, of course, the almost complete eschewing of even the lightest of indirect fire weaponry means that in open engagements they are going to have a very hard time indeed, as even heavy weaponry like autocannons and heavy bolters are very rare and few and far between, meaning that if the Anthonians find themselves employed in less than ideal circumstances, which <laughs> happens far more often than one would like in the Imperial Guard, they're likely to suffer severely, but when allowed to operate in their chosen environment, well, although I do think the mortars would be useful even in the densest of urban environments, you can make up for this with things like grenade launchers, for example, or simple hand grenades. The point-blank nature of the engagement would mean that frag grenades, crack grenades, and stun grenades would be incredibly worthwhile, not to mention melter charges, of course. As whilst the Anthonian tunnel rats themselves don't employ much in the way of armor or even heavy weaponry capable of cracking armor, well, if the enemy tank is stuck in a bunch of rubble trying to make its way into a housing complex, Mm, a melter bomb is a fine piece of anti-tank hardware. Crucially as well, the Anthonian tunnel rats will no doubt have developed a whole heaping heck of a lot of specialized doctrines and tactics. The correct gear is only half the battle, knowing how to utilize it is perhaps even the more important part. Flamethrowers, for example. Now, theoretically, if you're opposite an enemy and he's down that hallway and you down another, then simply just pressing the trigger and wafting it all down with flame should be pretty damn effective, right? Well, here's the issue. The thing with a flamethrower that actually kills your ass isn't first and foremost the flames, it's the fact that it takes away all of the oxygen and even, you know, hyperheats it and sets it on fire within your very lungs. Now that's great if you're shooting against an enemy in a bunker, for example, or in a confined space, but if you happen to find yourself inside of the very self-same confined space, <laughs> I imagine you can see the issues with this scenario. This, of course, also goes for things like fragmentation grenades or crack grenades or any form of um, carried explosives like tube charges. Again, throwing a tube charge into an enclosed space with enemies in it is going to produce very satisfying effects. Throwing a tube charge into the very same tunnel that you so happen to be occupying at the time might produce less satisfying effects. Frankly, when you're dealing with weapons of this destructive nature in very close and confined quarters, the trick, more often than not, is to be able to detonate the weapon or fire it without actually being there, or if you have to be there, being in such a position as to not see the backwash or the simple explosive force of the weapon hit you as well. 
That requires careful positioning and even more careful planning, as ambushes and prepared positions are of paramount importance in tunnel warfare. Urban warfare is, well, similar in many ways. It is a gruesome, grueling form of warfare, where you have to fight room to room, often against enemies of God only knows what strength or location or disposition or specializations or weaponry or whatever. The fog of war lies thick and heavy over the urban combat environment. Again, ambushes, traps, mines, prepared positions, etc. will all be incredibly valuable. And attacking into an area that might also have these defenses requires its very own set of expertise too. Of course, you could solve the problem by simply just tossing Imperial Guard troops at it until eventually it crumbles beneath the sheer weight of the bodies you've heaped upon it. But, like with most combat situations, it's always better to send in someone who actually knows what they're doing rather than the random chaff you've got lying around. Of course, this is still the Imperial Guard, however, and so I imagined the Tunnel Rats will be employed just as often in the role of Combat Cavalry as in their actual, you know, desired role. But hey, when they actually get a competent general who knows to husband his resources for the correct situation, I imagine they would be very, very effective. And the Tunnel Rats have one other crucial ability, gift more correctly, that might just set them above and apart from many other Imperial regiments. Incredible luck! Or at least that is the only way I can possibly explain the fact that their planet survived. You see, Athenos, um, it's a Necron tomb world. Yeah. <laughs> It's an agricultural world with a massive Necron force laying beneath it. Or, well, actually, that's part of the luck. It wasn't the biggest of tomb worlds. In fact, it was a very small tomb world, actually, occupied by Tazazar, the Invincible, as he now calls himself. A Necron overlord of a relatively minor dynasty and lineage. In fact, he used to be nothing more than a humble freebooter, a pirate, a corsair, a privateer, if you will. He used to be in the employ of the Zarnek dynasty, and he, like all of the other Necrons, went to sleep with a nice little boat of his very own, of course, and a nice little personal army as well, you know, Tazazar didn't do too bad for himself, upon the world of Athenos. He also had the good fortune, probably, you know, the world uh, affected him, or maybe vice versa, who knows, and he woke up extremely early. He was one of the very first Necron overlords, indeed, to re-emerge from slumber, although, again, he wasn't an overlord at the time. This gave him the extraordinarily enviable advantage of being able to find his way back home to his dynasty's homeworld and make sure that only those with easily reprogrammable cortexes actually got the pleasure of waking back up again, whilst the others, well, if they're lucky, they're still asleep. If not, well, <laughs> eternal slumber is a slumber of sorts. And that is how he became Overlord. But as for how this affects Athenos, well, when he awoken, he took all of his ships with him, bursting forth from deep beneath the ground, taking a sizable portion of Athenos's capital along with it, the majority, in fact, up into the stratosphere, burning, broken, etc. But as he re-emerged, more often than not, Necron will look out across the world, populated by little fleshy humans, and think, ooh, goody, slave labor, if you're lucky, or dinner, if you're not. However, um, one must presume that Tazazar was not perhaps the brightest of Necrons, as all he could see when he was busting his way through the countless hydroponics areas was clinging vines, garbage, and some sort of weird monkey creature clambering all over the place. Clearly, there was no intelligent life on this planet, so there was nothing worth subjugating or harvesting. Besides, 
his dynasty was calling, and so he simply departed without glassing the world before doing so, or unleashing uncountable legions of mechanical monsters upon the <laughs> wholly unprepared civilian populace, whose primary command center, of course, their capital, he had just destroyed by, well, simply activating the go up button. Blessed little world, Athenos, as it turns out, and long may it remain as such as the Imperium still has ample need of its tunnel rats. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.